Forget the Russia you know. I'm going to show you the Russia you don't. My Russia. Ahead on the show, reversing Russia's brain drain. We found out what the country's doing to keep its tech entrepreneurs at home. We believe we are the next devil, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and Kaspersky's cyber crusade. Russian software engineers are the best. The Russian... And at the same time, Russian malware engineers are the best because <laughs> malware is software. It's the chance of a lifetime. Success or failure in the balance. Writers, readers, and so on. Entrepreneurs have just 10 minutes to pitch and venture capitalists to listen on the lookout for new startups. So the example of this infrastructure that allows us to attract people from the, the pressure's on. Because we even the best salesmen can crack. This is in Silicon Valley, and it's not Moscow either. An hour and a half flight from the Russian capital, investors are on a tour of Kazan. So today, um, about 60% of our economy is based on oil and petrochemical industries. And one of the main uh, ideas, one of the main uh, objectives... The regional government is pulling out all the stops and picking up the tab. Really know how to pull out the red carpet. Thank you. Tata Rice Krispies. Wining and dining, a group of venture capitalists. That's really nice. Thank you very much for that meeting in your but... <laughs> Kazan's IT park is the main attraction. It's brand new and the largest such venture in Eastern Europe. Russia boasts a deep tradition of excellence in science, math, and engineering. Math and science graduates here are among the finest in the world. IT and Russia, it would seem, are a perfect fit. And an option when the oil runs dry. It is very simple. We want our economy to grow. And we believe that IT sector is a very good growth point because it takes no natural resources. It's, it's not about extracting oil and making some refinery process. It's not about machinery. It's, it's only dependent on intellectual resources. It's, it's about attracting ambitious people, those who can innovate and invent new intellectual property. Speech recognition software. Cool. Let's give it a try. My name is Ryan. Minya Zavut Ryan. It worked. I'm shown new inventions to improve voice recognition. And so what is this? Basically, this is a 3D analyzing and modeling system searching for oil. Mikhail Bizruk is showing off one of the venture capitalist's favorite gadgets. Displayer from Display and Air projects images onto a stream of vapor. How does this work? It also allows me to play Angry Birds in an entirely new way. Hey! <laughs> Maybe your dream is to be king. Russia's best and brightest innovators have been leaving for the last 20 years, called the Big Brain Drain, and the aim is to stop it. The IT park in Kazan is just a baby when compared to what lies ahead. Construction's begun on the mother of innovation parks in Skolkova. In the outskirts of Moscow. This is the very first. Uh, yes, it's the very first be the first time it will be everything. Our Congress Center, our Conference Center, our headquarters, but first period of development of the project. The plan is so ambitious, some are calling it Russia's Silicon Valley. Skolkova will include a university and an R&D center with heavyweight partners like Intel, Nokia, and Microsoft. Professor Ed Crawley is an MIT man who will head up the new university, Skolkova Tech. Even for a rocket scientist, this sounds a bit ambitious, no? 
This is, this is audacious. It's beyond ambitious. <laughs> but uh, it's, I call it a once in 10 lifetimes opportunity mm -hmm. to uh, establish a, a new technical university of world class in a place that's as rich with intellectual tradition as Russia. How do you know that this idea really um, has legs? Well, it has legs because it's fundamentally the right thing to do. If you were in charge of an economy that was largely fueled by raw materials, which had a finite lifespan, you would know that really the only option is to convert to a knowledge-based and manufacturing-based economy while you still had the resources from oil. And you're convinced that Russia recognizes that they have an oil addiction problem? Absolutely. So this is a startup. You know, we're working 24-7 here to make a great university. When will you know it's, it's a success? Ah, I have a very easy metric of that. It's the first time a student applies to MIT and Skolkova Tech and gets in at both places and decides to come here. <laughs> I'm on my way to meet a Russian who won the Nobel Prize for physics. Only, I'm not in Russia. At least 200,000 of Russia's best minds are thought to have left the country in the 1990s when investment in science was abandoned. For Russia to succeed, it'll have to convince people like Professor Game to trade Manchester for Moscow. When I was living in Russia, early 1990s, late 80s, there was this euphoria that everything would happen very quickly within 10, 15, 20 years. This euphoria has gone. Now we understand that it requires sort of a cultural change. It's still there is a lot of Soviet kind of mentality in Russia. Back in Kazan, there are encouraging, tentative signs of change. Even some of my personal friends have returned from Silicon Valley back to Russia. And um, while I cannot say that it's a major return of talent back to Russia, but this has been happening. And the reason for that is the improvement in the quality of life. They feel that they can still be part of something big, even while in Russia. They, they kind of feel that there is this entrepreneurial wave coming into Russia right now, and there is a lot of opportunities. Still to come on Ryan's Russia, he travels the world fighting crime, and his enemies are everywhere. Right now, are we vulnerable? Yes, of course. So I shouldn't be so relaxed right now. I'm here. So you, you may relax. <laughs> I estimate the damage because of cybercrime on their global economy could be between 100 billion to maybe 1 trillion US dollars a year. Cyber wars and cyber terrorists, they want to damage internet infrastructure, communications, telephone destroy power plants, turn the transportation system into chaos. We live in a world controlled by computers. But what if the computers themselves were destroyed? I'm afraid there are very bad scenarios uh, possible. What if the lights went out? Eugene Kaspersky is both dramatic and funny. This is how you see yourself. Yeah, like this, yes. <laughs> Owner and co-founder of Europe's largest internet security company. We have a lot of statistics from our service. His job is to keep the computers of 300 million people up and running. So this is Trojans which are pretending to be antivirus. Ah. Spy is a spy Kaspersky spy. shows me what his engineers are up against in the virus lab. You run it, it doesn't damage the system, but reports, oh, okay, so your system is infected. Now pay money to disinfect. You pay money, you download a fake cleaner. It reports, okay, now it's clean.
The KGB educated cryptologists started disinfecting computers in the 1990s. Back then, one new virus was generated every hour. Today, it's one a second. So what's he working on? In this case, this is a ransomware. The malware which encrypts the files on the disk and displays a message, pay money to decrypt it or pay money to unlock your system. That happens. Yes, and people pay because they don't know what to do. But in 2010, Kaspersky saw something that made ransomware look like child's play. A virus had destroyed the machines at the heart of Iran's nuclear program by telling them to spin out of control until they destroyed themselves. And it worked. The virus was called Stuxnet. The Stuxnet attack on Iran to you spelled the dawn of a really new problem. To be honest, we were waiting for some kind of that attack for years. Uh, because the idea of uh, cyber attacks, um, like cyber terrorist attacks or uh, cyber weapon, it came to the mind of uh, security experts years before it happened. And you studied the attack on Iran? Yes. There was a group of uh, my engineers, there were three to five of them, uh, and they were working for two or three months to analyze, to complete the analysis, to understand what's that, uh, to open all the hidden doors in this malware because it's extremely complicated. How big of an effort do you think it, it, it took to, to make that virus, that malware? 20, 30, maybe more people in at least one year of work. You learned from it. Do you think that the Iranians learned from it? I'm afraid yes. And that's why I'm, I'm definitely against cyber weapon and cyber wars uh, because it's a boomerang. Uh, it's very... I hit you, you say, oh, that's how he hit me and you hit back. Exactly. Uh, so it's, it's possible, well, it's not easy, but it's very possible to learn from this attack. Uh, if a victim doesn't have enough of engineers, they can employ engineers. Worth an estimated $800 million, Kaspersky can afford to put his feet up. But he does very little of that. Instead, he travels the world sounding the alarm on cyber warfare. Anywhere he can get an audience. Internet Interpol, international cooperation. Like this Internet Security uh, Summit he sponsors in Cancun, Mexico. To trace the bad guys. Or in snowy Davos, Switzerland, where international leaders gather annually at the World Economic Forum. But convincing governments the Internet should be an area free of military activity isn't easy. I caught up with Kaspersky and his campaign in London, just after the British military set up its own unit of cyber soldiers. You recognize when you say cyber warfare, a lot of people are going to think that you're being sensationalist. The cyber weapon is a, it's a really new, and uh, unfortunately, not many people recognize it as a way. It's a dangerous stuff. Uh, the most of uh, governments, most of officials, which are responsible for their military projects, uh, they think it's a new opportunity for them. So it's not a sensational for them. It's, uh, it's now it's a reality, and uh, the problem is that uh, there are many governments already announced that they are going to invest in the cyber weapons and the military cyber divisions. And you could shut down life in the UK? Uh, I am not so comfortable to talk about the real scenarios. Three zero, expected two five zero. Turn left heading to three zero, panel three zero. Kaspersky's crusade to save the cyber world continues. We're on our way to Russia. How much do you travel? Oh, a lot. More than 90 flights a year. You talk a lot about how vulnerable we are yeah. to cyber criminals, cyber terrorists, cyber warfare. Right now, are we vulnerable? Yes, of course. On the plane. <laughs> so I shouldn't be so relaxed right now. Yeah. Right now, you may relax. I'm here. So you, can, <laughs> yeah. so you may relax. <laughs> Any serious construction, planes, cars, 
uh, they depend on IT, and without their uh, IT systems, uh, they simply they, they can they can function. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Moscow. Thank you for using services of airport. Kaspersky, I am learning, sees risk everywhere. Even riding in the car with bodyguards. <laughs> I'm paranoid. Talking about security, I'm paranoid. So when I'm in the car, I also think about computers in the car. How do they behave? Is there any mistakes in uh, security uh, architecture in uh, of the cars? Transportation is maybe future targets of cyber attacks. After the break, hacktivism. We just got news from China, India and Japan that they announced that they are going to recruit cyber armies. Russia doesn't just produce Kasperskys, it's also one of the world's biggest producers of so-called black hat hackers. Industry lingo for hackers who work on the dark side. Posed to the more benign white hat hackers. Russian cyber criminals, I think that uh, they are more professional. Russian criminal malware is more complicated. Simply because the Russian technical education system works very well. Russian software engineers are the best. The and at the same time, Russian malware engineers are the best because <laughs> malware is software. Russia's law enforcement agencies gave us this video of their raids on suspected hacking operations in Moscow. He, the police say, was stealing money from banks. In one hideout, the police find flyers advertising services like hacking into other people's accounts, so-called DDoS attacks that shut down websites. The operation looks impressive, but observers say few get caught. There are so many hackers in Russia, there's even a Russian language magazine called Haka with a circulation of more than 200,000. Your magazine is for hackers. Yeah, uh, the Hacker magazine, of course, it's for hackers, but we are uh, making here um, White Hat magazine for people who are deeply interested in programming, creating software. You can't be 100% certain that a black hat... Well, uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of black hat hackers reading our magazine. It doesn't matter. The main value of its technical articles, and we share these knowledges with people. How, how do they use it? It's uh, their own uh, responsibility. Why are there so many good Russian hackers? I think uh, it's economical reason. Working on the field of cybercrime, you can earn one million, two millions of dollars just for, for one year, for example. In Russia. Hacking isn't only about stealing, it can also be political. Hackers who act as activists are called hacktivists. Government officials get hacked. Opponents of the government get hacked. Anton Nozik, a Kremlin critic and architect of many of the country's social networks, says his blog is assaulted on a daily basis. There are successful things that they pull off, like spam attacks, flood attacks, uh, trolling attacks. Uh, that they create robots that uh, post incessant comments uh, in my name, in my blogs, in all of my blogs, mentioning me. So every day I get tens of emails uh, informing me that there has been an attack uh, an attempt to log in as me in my PayPal, in my Yahoo, in my Google, um, uh, in my Amazon. Americans come to London. Back home, Kaspersky doesn't like what he sees. The number of cyber soldiers, possibly already in the tens of thousands, is growing. 
activists who use hacking to accomplish their goals. Your big concern is eventually they become government agents. Um, unfortunately, yes, and we just got news uh, uh, from China, India, and Japan uh, that they announced that they are going to recruit uh, hacktivists, uh, cyber armies uh, to fight with the uh, future enemies in the future cyber conflicts. And I'm afraid it's uh, one more bad news because uh, governments, they are too serious about cyber weapons. And I'm afraid it makes this world less stable and less safe. And safe. I get the sense that for you this is about more than business, that fighting cybercrime is personal. Yes. My goal, the target of my life is uh, to make this world, the internet world, the dig digital world more clean, more secure. It's a mission which, uh, which drives you, which uh, makes you to think all the time. And I think it's the right way to do good things in this world. Next week on Ryan's Russia, culture. In Russia, chess isn't just a game, it's a sport. And then we delve into Russia's delicacies. You probably know almost nothing about Russian cuisine. Fear not, I'm a bit of an expert. And then it's Russia's newest export, rock and roll. government is pulling out all the stops and picking up the tab. Really know how to pull out the red carpet. Thank you. Satire Rice Krispies. Wining and dining a group of venture capitalists. Kazan's IT park is the main attraction. It's brand new and the largest such venture in Eastern Europe. Russia boasts a deep tradition of excellence in science, math, and engineering. Math and science graduates here are among the finest in the world. IT and Russia, it would seem, are a perfect fit. And an option when the oil runs dry. It's the chance of a lifetime. Success or failure in the balance. Writers, readers, and so on. Entrepreneurs have just 10 minutes to pitch and venture capitalists to listen on the lookout for new startups. So the example of this infrastructure that allows us to attract people from the, the pressure's on, because with even the best salesmen can crack.
This isn't Silicon Valley, and it's not Moscow either. An hour and a half flight from the Russian capital, investors are on a tour of Kazan. So today, um, about 60 percent of our economy is based on oil and petrochemical industries. And one of the main uh, ideas, one of the main uh, objectives. Displayer from Display and Air projects images onto a stream of vapor. How does this work? It also allows me to play Angry Birds in an entirely new way. Hey! <laughs> Maybe your dream is to be king. Russia's best and brightest innovators have been leaving for the last 20 years, called the big brain drain. And the aim is to stop it. The IT park in Kazan is just a baby when compared to what lies ahead. Construction's begun on the mother of innovation parks in Skolkova. In the outskirts of Moscow. This is the very first uh, yes, building. Yes, it will be the first time it will be. Forget the Russia you know. I'm going to show you the Russia you don't. My Russia. Ahead on the show, reversing Russia's brain drain. We found out what the country's doing to keep its tech entrepreneurs at home. We believe we are the next devil, yes. <laughs> and Kaspersky's cyber crusade. Russian software engineers are the best. The Russian... And at the same time, Russian malware engineers are the best because <laughs> malware is software. very simple we want our economy to grow and we believe that IT sector is a very good growth point because it takes no natural resources it's it's not about extracting oil and making some refinery process it's not about machinery it's it's only dependent on intellectual resources it's it's about attracting ambitious people those who can innovate and invent new intellectual property speech recognition software cool let's give it a try my name is Ryan. Minya Zavut Ryan. It worked. I'm shown new inventions to improve voice recognition. And so what is this? Basically, this is a 3D analyzing and modeling system searching for oil. Mikhail Bizruk is showing off one of the venture capitalist's favorite gadgets. 